When I was a young boy at the dinner table, my mother would tell me, make sure you eat your vegetables. And when I would hear those words, I would cringe and shrink. The emotions and sentiments inside of me would not feel comfortable. I wanted to close my ears. What I wanted to hear was, eat your ice cream, eat your candy. However, what she was telling me was what I needed to hear. For what she was telling me was the truth, and that truth ultimately would serve as a benefit for the health of my body. And so this principle could be applied to the spiritual life. Sometimes we only want to hear the things that we want to hear. We only want to hear the things that make us feel comfortable. However, we have to be open to hearing the things that we need to hear, and that is the truth, because it is the truth that will ultimately nourish our spiritual health and be for the betterment of our immortal soul. As Jesus teaches in the gospel, the truth will set you free. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because in our gospel reading today, Jesus gives us certain truths and imagery that may perhaps be tough to swallow. Maybe something that we don't want to hear and that perhaps may even make us feel uncomfortable. However, it is the truth and we have to be open to embracing it because again, the truth will ultimately nourish our spiritual soul. And so in the gospel reading today, Jesus says these words, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Some other translations use the term hell. For Gehenna in biblical times was a valley right outside of Jerusalem, and in this valley was a fire that burned garbage. It was a place that was known as to be perpetually unclean because of child sacrifices that took place there centuries beforehand. And so in the New Testament, Jesus uses the term Gehenna when he teaches about the reality of hell. Now, in this sacred scripture, it doesn't specify who is the one that we should fear. Some biblical scholars uh, say that a way that we could spiritually interpret this is that the one we should fear is the devil, for he is one who tempts us and deceives us into sin, therefore he can and should be feared. However, at the same time, it can be spiritually interpreted that the one that we should ultimately fear is God himself. For we know that God will ultimately be our judge. When we die, we will have to stand before the judgment seats of God and we will have to give an account of our life to the Lord. And we will either be rewarded eternal bliss in the kingdom of heaven forever, even if perhaps we have to pass through purgatory, or we will be condemned into hell, in eternal torment where there will be no end and there will be no exit door in hell. This is the truth. And this being the case, alongside with our call to love God, which really should be a response to God first loving us, alongside with love, we are also called to have a healthy fear of God. For this healthy fear will serve as an incentive for us to repent of our sins, 
to amend our lives and to act justly. This, in fact, is evidence in sacred scripture. We see Moses say this very thing in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. He says to them, God has come to test you, and that the fear of him may be before your eyes, that you may not sin. In the New Testament, even after Jesus gives his new law of love, St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, in light and in view of our eternal destination, he says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. He is instilling in us a healthy fear of God. You can imagine an athlete who knows that it is possible that they could lose the game, that will serve as an incentive for them to practice hard, to be disciplined in their training. Well, when we are playing the game of life and we are playing against the powerful opponents of the flesh, the world, and the devil, we need incentives to help us take it seriously, take sanctity seriously, and to be well-disciplined in the spiritual life. We even see in our everyday common things at times that there is a healthy fear being instilled in us for a benefit. For example, we drive on the road, and when we drive, we see signs of laws. And the signs at times don't fail to mention what the possible consequences are, what the possible penalties are. For example, if, if you break this law, you, you will be fined well, $500, whatever it may be. Uh, commonly in parenting, what happens many times is when the parent instructs their children what the rules are, uh, many times the parent doesn't fail to mention what the possible consequences are. For example, you're going to be grounded, or you may not have the privilege of using the car for two weeks, whatever it may be. They're mentioning it, again, as an incentive for them to act justly. We even see this in our own faith. For example, we are here gathered at the Blessed Virgin Mary's apparition site, which is approved by Holy Mother Church, as to be deemed worthy of belief. And when the Blessed Mother appeared as Our Lady of Good Help, even before she said anything about teaching the children their catechism and how to approach the sacraments, before she said that, she said, if sinners do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. It is partly a message of warning and instilling a healthy fear in us. Our Lord himself, when he appeared to St. Faustina, which is also an approved apparition, deemed worthy of belief, our Lord said to her, and this is found in her diary, number 1146, Jesus said, he who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. Again, he's not failing to mention consequences. Even in divine revelation, which has more weight than the private revelations because we are all obliged to believe in God's eternal truth, especially what he reveals in uh, the scriptures and from Connected scriptures, of course, we have the teachings of the magisterium of the church and sacred tradition, but even in scripture, when our Lord teaches us about how we are to act, he doesn't neglect to mention the possibilities of penalties. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, when he gives the parable about the master of the household who entrusts his household to a servant. And when the master of the household is gone, uh, Jesus says in this account, 
that suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And so the motive and intention of repenting from our sins out of a fear is called attrition, which is also known as an imperfect act of contrition. Now, it's important that we do not misunderstand the term imperfect. The term imperfect, in this case, doesn't mean something bad or defective. What it means is that it is less than the highest ideal. Perhaps you've heard of, you know, good, better, best. Well, well, the levels under best doesn't mean that they're disordered. Therefore, the term imperfect has benefits, advantages, and it also comes from God. This is confirmed in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1453. It says, The contrition called imperfect is also a gift of God, a prompting of the Holy Spirit. It is born of the consideration of sin's ugliness or the fear of eternal damnation and the other penalties threatening the sinner. Such a stirring of conscience can initiate an interior process which, under the promptings of grace, will be brought to completion by sacramental absolution, which points to the great sacrament of confession, also known as reconciliation. The saints themselves, such as Saint John Vianney, did not fail in instilling a healthy fear in people, especially in regards to the use of the sacraments of confession. For example, he says this, if one said to those poor lost souls that have been so long in hell, we are going to place a priest at the gate of hell. All who wish to confess have only to go out. Do you think, my children, that a single one would remain? The most guilty would not be afraid of telling their sins, nor even of telling them before the whole world. Oh, how soon hell would be a desert and how heaven would be peopled. Well, we have the time and the means which those poor lost souls have not. And I'm quite sure that those wretched ones say in hell, O oh, accursed priest, if I had never known you, I should not be so guilty. And as this homily is, is primarily teaching about having a healthy fear of God in light of the specific teaching of the gospel today, I do not want to fail nor neglect mentioning what the ultimate goal is, which in hope that the healthy fear of God will serve as a stepping stone to ultimately hopefully reach the ideal. And that ideal is love. I mentioned earlier about an analogy of you know, children called to obey their parents. Just think of a situation, maybe a teenager who has been given the rule of, of, of obeying a curfew well, let's say this teenager breaks his curfew and uh, the mother is up at night, worried, perhaps even crying, concerned about the safety of her son. Well, when the son returns back home and, and he has to face his mother, well, he 
can be sorry for what he's done because he's going to get grounded, but he should ultimately be sorry because he has offended the love of his mother because his mother has the best interest for him. And therefore, we have a Heavenly Father who has the best interest for us. So it is a matter of both ends, not either or. To have a balance, as St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us, that virtue lies in the middle. And so what I give as a recommendation, as perhaps a resolution for all of us, is that I recommend a daily examination of conscience with an act of contrition, perhaps at the end of the day before we go to bed. We think of the things that we have done, any offenses we committed, and any sins of omission, and then we make that act of contrition, which is an expression of our sorrow for sins and a resolution to do better. And there is that traditional act of contrition that includes both a fear and also an expression of love for God. I'm just going to mention this act of contrition here. You are more than welcome to join me in the silence of your heart if you know it. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended you, and I detest all of my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all, because they offend you, my God, who art all good and deserving of all of my love. I firmly resolve with the help of your grace to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.